So hello everyone and um, on countless requests you people are asking me to again do a fundus ride and a quick ride of all the images in the ophthalmology and uh, for all those people who are worrying about the ophthalmology revision they are not very sure I think this will be a one stop solution if you go through all these images and the discussion I think that is the best possible mini revision of the ophthalmology so without wasting uh, much time let's start. So let us see the first image. You can see that this is the upper lid and this is the lower lid. Okay, and you can see the adhesion. So this is actually the adhesion. This is the adhesion between the two eyelids. When there is a adhesion between the two eyelids, this is called as ankylo. This is called as the ankyloblephron. The term blephro is used for the eyelids and ankylo is adhesion. So the two eyelids are joined together. This is ankyloblephron. Now while covering all these images, I'll make sure that we are undergoing all the PYQs also. So if you have done this one, you have done all the images, all the important things related to it and also the PYQs up till 2017 so make sure that you watch this video completely okay you have to be with me in throughout the session okay so this is ankyloblephron now when i talk about this ankyloblephron okay there is one more thing that uh, you can confuse with another thing is called as the symblephron okay so what is the difference between the ankyloblephron and symblephron symblephron is actually the adhesion of the conjunctiva the adhesion of the conjunctiva is called as symblephron adhesion of the two eyelids is called as ankyloblephron and adhesion of the conjunctiva is seen whenever we have the raw area so this is again a very common finding that you get in cases of the membranous in cases of the membranous type of conjunctivitis which membranous conjunctivitis the true membranous conjunctivitis again a important pyq you are not going to get this in the false membranous you are going to get this in the true membranous conjunctivitis okay now look at this this is very very important and we have talked about this so many times this is a slit lamp image this is a slit lamp image and inside this you can see the central plaque like opacity. You can see the central plaque like opacity. So if you are seeing a central plaque like opacity, this is actually posterior subcapsular cataract that is PSC. Okay, posterior subcapsular cataract. Now another important thing is what are the causes of this posterior subcapsular cataract because this causes the maximum diminution of vision. So the morphology again an important PYQ the morphology which causes maximum diminution of vision is this posterior subcapsular cataract. So what are the causes of the PSC? The causes of PSC is I got a BSC. I got a BSC. So I for the ionizing radiations. Ionizing radiations is an important cause for the posterior subcapsular cataract, especially the glass blowers cataract. G for glass blowers cataract. This glass blowers cataract is caused by the infrared rays. Caused by the infrared rays. Then we have got A. A for atopic dermatitis. A for atopic dermatitis. And what is the name of this cataract? This cataract is called as a shield cataract. This is called as a shield cataract. Then B. B for buzulfin. Another drug is the buzulfin. Then we have S. S for the steroids. Steroids are important source of osseous subcapsular cataract. Now another mnemonic that I usually tell you in Relation to steroids is the GTCS, generalized tonic-clonic seizures. So the topical steroids, if I talk about the topical steroids, it causes the glaucoma. 
and if i talk about the systemic steroids it causes the cataract okay now which type of cataract we see the subcapsula what type of glaucoma secondary open angle glaucoma it is a secondary open angle type of glaucoma and then we have got c c for chloroquine chloroquine causes the posterior subcapsular cataract then we also have the c c for the christmas tree cataract christmas tree cataract and then also c for something else also which is important for your neat pg 2023 that is the complicated cataract c for the complicated cataract also and i am sure you are going to get one question in complicated cataract in the 2023 so you have to remember that complicated cataract is the posterior subcapsular cataract it is occurring after the most common cause is the chronic anterior uveitis and the two very very important features what were the two important features of this cataract one and two one was the polychromatic lustre one is the polychromatic lustre and second is the bread crumb bread crumb appearance polychromatic lustre and bread crumb appearance are the two important features also very very important okay now coming to the next one see this what can you see here can you see the uh, ring like appearance here so basically this is called as the onion ring appearance this is called as the onion ring appearance and this onion ring appearance is seen in the posterior polar cataract this is seen in cases of the posterior polar cataract onion ring appearance so you have to be very very sure when it is posterior subcapsular cataract when it is posterior polar cataract and the onion ring appearance is found in cases of the posterior polar cataract okay then we have discussed the causes of the posterior subcapsular cataract now certain fancy names certain fancy names of the cataract like uh, one is the rosette cataract rosette cataract is caused by the blunt trauma this is caused by the blunt trauma then we have the sun flower cataract sun flower cataract may we have got three causes one is the penetrating trauma penetrating trauma and um, then we have the wilson's disease wilson's disease is there and then number 3 what is the number 3 it is the chalcosis or the copper deposition then number 3 is the snow flake cataract snow flake cataract is found in the diabetes it's a true metabolic cataract then now uh, we have talked about the christmas tree cataract christmas um, tree cataract is found in the dystrophica myotonica dystrophica myotonica you must be remembering that uh, dystrophica myotonica is a, a systemic disease and you can again get a integrated question on this okay then we also have the oil droplet cataract oil droplet cataract is found in the galactosemia galactosemia is again important because this can give you a question of ophthalm plus the biochemistry so whenever you get a question on the galactose intolerance or you get a question on only reversible cataract if you get a question on only reversible cataract then also it is galactosemia then we also have a shield cataract shield cataract is found in the atopic dermatitis this is found in cases of the atopic dermatitis so all these are the fancy names of the cataract along with their clinical scenario types okay then see this this is very very iconic you can see the kf ring you can see the typical kf ring again a important topic for 2023 kf ring that is the kaiser fleischer ring this is the kaiser fleischer ring and um, this ring is actually golden brown in color it is the golden brown in color and um, in which layer it is present it is present in the desmens membrane of the cornea it is reversible on the treatment and it is first present in superior and inferior quadrants it is first present in the superior and the inferior quadrants 
now because this is found in cases of wilson's disease okay this is found in the wilson's disease where we get the hepato lenticular hepato lenticular degeneration okay so liver manifestations and we are getting the cns manifestations both the manifestations are present liver manifestations may 50 to 55% will show the kf ring it will show the kf ring cns may 90 to 95% will show the kf ring 90 to 95% will show the kf ring again a very very important thing and uh, this was asked in the ini ct 2020 okay this is a important question coming to the next one now see this this is a very important sign and um, recently in the inset examination november 2022 also we have got this question that uh, a patient having the injury having the injury with the fish tail a patient having a injury with the fish tail is coming with this so what is this this is actually the pus in the anterior chamber therefore it is called as hypopion so pus in anterior chamber is a hypopion now you have to see what kind of hypopion it is so usually hypopion if it is there you have to think about three things okay with respect to the questions either it can be post operative either it can be post operative post operative may most common is the cataract surgery and when i am talking about the cataract surgery it is the bacterial and of thelmitis so it can be the bacterial and of thelmitis there we can get the hypopion this is the first thing second i can have second i can have the bacterial corneal ulcers we can have the bacterial corneal ulcer or the bacterial keratitis that will also show the hypopion and then we have got the third thing third is the fungal third is the fungal keratitis okay so there are mainly two kind of corneal ulcers where we have a hypopion now when we have a bacterial hypopion when we have a bacterial hypopion always remember that it is will be always sterile and always mobile always sterile and always mobile but when it's a fungal one it is non sterile and it will be non mobile and it will be non mobile okay so always be clear about the hypopion and when it is present then you have to remember the most dangerous hypopions the most dangerous hypopions if i talk about the most dangerous hypopions then it is caused by the pneumococcus followed by the pseudomonas most dangerous will be pneumococcus followed by the pseudomonas then coming to this one now because they have given you hypopion then they can ask you this also this is the blood in the anterior chamber which is called as the hyphema blood in the anterior chamber is called as the hyphema and this is the most common early post operative complication most common early post operative complication is hyphema okay now there are two more questions that can be asked with respect to the hyphema what is the most common source of the traumatic hyphema what is the most common source of the traumatic hyphema this is a pyq also most common source of traumatic hyphema is the major arterial circle it is the major arterial circle and this major arterial circle is present at the root of the iris second important question is that uh, whenever we have this traumatic hyphema what should be the first test that you should do so if i have blood in anterior chamber we will have raised intraocular pressure therefore it should be the tonometry so the first test that we are going to do in this patient should be tonometry okay all right now see this this everybody must be knowing i think this is your blue baby boy this is the blue baby boy and uh, the question came with the name of bablu blue is the sclera bilateral 
and the baby will present with the BPL card. So you can see here we are having the bilateral involvement. We are having the blue sclera also. Okay. And this baby usually will present with the BPL card below poverty line. So B for blepharospasm. Blepharo means for the eyelids. Okay. So this baby will come with the blepharospasm. Then we have photophobia. We have photophobia and then L will be the lacrimation. So usually this baby will come with the triad, classical triad of blepharospasm, photophobia and lacrimation. So we can see the spasm here. We can see photophobia. Now photophobia usually baby cannot say I have photophobia. There will be fear of light. So most of the time you will see that the baby is trying to put his or her eyes away from the light and lacrimation you can see watering. So um, the most common out of these three will be the lacrimation while photophobia will be the earliest manifestation. Earliest manifestation is the photophobia while the most common is the lacrimation. Okay, now what are the other things that we can have? We can also have the hazy cornea. Hazy cornea, this is called as the frosted glass appearance. Now, if they have not um, given this in the question, even you can appreciate this from the picture also. The iris details will not be clear. So, you cannot see the iris details here because you cannot see iris details. It is a frosted glass appearance and then this baby can also come with the megalocornea. So, this baby with BPL card, with the frosted glass appearance, with the megalocornea, with the blue sclera, very, very typical of the beautiful moss whole of the clinical scenario can come as a image based question and a very very important PYQ also all right now see this again a very very typical picture of the acute red eye a very very typical picture of acute red eye you can see here we are having the circum corneal congestion we are also having the circumcorneal congestion. Now, whenever we are having acute red eye, I told you, you have to think about acute congestive glaucoma or the acute anterior uveitis. Now, can I say, is it uveitis or is it glaucoma? Circumcorneal congestion will be present in both, but you can see that the pupil is mid dilated. So, because the pupil is mid dilated, therefore it is going in terms of the glaucoma. Then they will tell you about the patient scenario more than 50 years and she will be female along with the hazy cornea. Because of the sudden closure of angle of anterior chamber, you will have hazy cornea, mid dilated pupil more than 50 years female and she will also come with a very very typical symptom of colored halos. She will also come with a very typical symptom of colored halos. Now, Colored halos DD is again important. Uh, when I talk about the DD, one is the cataract, one is the cataract, then second is this acute congestive glaucoma, while third is the acute mucopurulent, acute mucopurulent conjunctivitis. So whenever you have a colored halos in the question, always think about this DD, okay? Now, once uh, you are sure, then you can also look for the walk stride here. This is again an inset question. Inset question in the um, early uh, month of the year, in 2022 itself, the earlier paper, they had asked that where it is found. So walk stride is found in the acute congestive glaucoma. And uh, this will be seen over the slit lamp. And what are the parts of this? So one will be the glaucoma flecons. What, a, what do you mean by glaucoma flecons? Glaucoma flecons means anterior subcapsular cataract. Then number two, we will have the patches of iris atrophy because the intraocular pressure is very, very high. So when I am having very, very high intraocular pressure, eye stony hand, we can get the patches of iris atrophy. And number three, we will get the mid -dil uh, dilated. Uh, pupil but uh, yeah but mid dilated pupil is not the part of the triad okay we will have the pigments on the corneal endothelium pigments on the corneal endothelium so this is the vox triad very very important now another important thing is about the treatment so first drug to be given second drug to be given drug of choice and the treatment of choice okay first drug to be given is the IV acetazolamide first drug to be given is IV acetazolamide second drug to be given is IV mannitol then uh, drug of choice is uh, 
pilocarbine okay drug of choice is pilocarbine treatment of choice is laser iridotomy or it can be surgical pi so you have to be very very sure acetazolamide and mannitol are not the drug of choice they are just the first and second drug to be used okay why acetazolamide is a first one because it is acting on the aqueous humor and mannitol is acting on the vitreous humor that is why it is a second drug it is having the mid dilatation of the pupil therefore pilocarpine which is a meiotic drug because it is a meiotic drug that is why it is the drug of choice and main problem is occurring due to pupillary block so we are creating the accessory pupil with the help of laser iridotomy or surgical pi so li see this this is the li li is the laser iridotomy laser iridotomy if i am creating the opening with the help of a laser while if i am creating with the help of a surgical resection this is the surgical resection which is called as the peripheral called as the peripheral iridectomy peripheral iridectomy laser iridotomy or the surgical peripheral iridectomy okay these are also the treatment of choice for the prophylaxis these two are also the treatment of choice for the prophylaxis for the fellow eye fellow eye prophylaxis in cases of the angle closure glaucoma now when i ask you the treatment of choice as a prophylaxis for the fellow eye it is different for angle closure glaucoma and it is different for the open angle glaucoma treatment of choice for the prophylaxis in cases of the open angle glaucoma is the laser trabeculoplasty it is a laser trabeculoplasty for the acute angle closure glaucoma it is the laser iridotomy or surgical pi all right now see this this is again a very very important question this came in neat pg 2022 as a image based question and uh, they had just asked the spot diagnosis they had just asked the spot diagnosis you can see this is a pseudo exfoliation syndrome or pseudo exfoliative glaucoma because um, what you can see in the picture you can see this dandruff like material because you are seeing the dandruff like material therefore it is a pseudo exfoliative glaucoma and it is a secondary open angle glaucoma it's a secondary open angle glaucoma okay now once you know this another thing which is important for 2023 is this here you can see the pigments pigments on the posterior surface of the cornea posterior surface of the cornea the pigments on the posterior surface of the cornea these are actually called as the crukken berg spindles these are called as the crukken berg spindles very very important and um, they are present in the pigmentary glaucoma they are present in the pigmentary glaucoma which is important for 2023 and when you get this krukenberg spindles another important sign is the sempau lazis line another important thing is the sempau lazis line sempau lazis line will be the pigments along the shawl base line pigments along the shawlways line will be called as the sampau lazis line and what is shawlways line that is another mcq shawlways line is the prominent end of this is the prominent end of the desmins membrane prominent end of the desmins membrane of the cornea now you cannot see the shawlways line by the naked eye or by the slit lamp alone so it is seen only on gonioscopy that is why this will be a gonioscopic finding therefore this will be a gonioscopic finding okay now another very very typical picture what is this this is the typical headlight this is the typical headlight in the fog appearance the typical headlight in the fog appearance so why where it is found it is present in the cases of the toxoplasmosis headlight in the fog appearance typically found in the toxoplasmosis so um, whenever you get such kind of a picture you already know that they are talking about toxoplasmosis and uh, the main host is a cat here then another important thing very very typical this is the here you can see this is the pale retina and 
you are getting this reddish spot all around so this is the cherry red spot this is actually the cherry red spot and uh, cherry red spot have number of causes so if you look at the dd of the cherry red spot what is the dd and the most important is the cro so before talking about the dd let's assume that this is a case of the cro so what is the case profile of this patient he will be more than 50 years he will be male usually we will have the history of diabetes uh, we can get hypertension, MI attack history can be there. Then you can get history of hypercholesterolemia. Cholesterolemia can be there. Then we can also have the carotid stenosis. We can also get the carotid stenosis. If this carotid stenosis is more than 90%, then that means it can be a case of the ocular ischemic syndrome. It can be a case of the ocular ischemic syndrome. So one of the presentation of the ocular ischemic syndrome is also the CRO. Now once you are sure, now we will talk about the DDs. DDs may we have the cherry trees never grows. Never grows tall in the mud and the sand. Okay, this is the total DD. So this will be CRAO. Then we have the Tay-Sec disease. Then we have the Neiman Pick disease. Neiman Pick disease. Then uh, we have the ganglio. Gangliosidosis is there. Then we have the trauma. Now when I am talking about the trauma, this is actually the blunt trauma. And in the blunt trauma, we get the Berlin zedema. We get the Berlin zedema. Berlin zedema is actually the macular edema. Then we have MM is the metachromatic. We have the metachromatic leukodystrophy. Metachromatic leukodystrophy. And finally, we have got the sand. This is the Sandhoff disease this end of disease so very very typical so whenever you get a male more than 50 years of age with hypercholesterolemia with mi you can think about crao another important thing is that cherry red spot along with the rapd if you are getting rapd then it is the only dd amongst all that you are going to get rapd positive and this is actually a ocular emergency this is actually a ocular emergency so if it is an emergency condition it's a rapd it's a male it, uh, having all these risk factors and you have to treat it as a case of crio on the other hand if you get this kind of a picture then this is the typical splashed tomato appearance this is the typical splashed tomato appearance which is found in crvo Again, more than 50 years male with very, very typical history of the hypertension and smoking along with very, very typical hypertension and smoking. And what are the other important things? You are going to get the 90 day glaucoma, 90 day glaucoma um, or you can say 100 day glaucoma, which is a kind of a neovascular glaucoma, one of the important complications which is found in the ischemic ischemic kind of crvo while if the patient is having the non ischemic type if the patient is having the non ischemic crvo then we can get the cystoid macular edema so both have the different complications so you can easily differentiate whether it's a case of crvo or it's a case of crvo another important uh, landmark here is the hypertension retinopathy hypertension retinopathy and uh, what is the cheat code for hypertension retinopathy we are going to get the tidy funders whenever we are going to get the neat and tidy funders so, so there are two important things you will get these large large these are the soft exudates or the cotton wool spots and these flame shaved hemorrhages so whenever you are getting two important things in the funders what are the two important things you are able to see the cotton wool spots cotton wool spots or the soft exudates or the soft exudates and the another thing that you get is the flame 
shaped hemorrhages so whenever we get the cotton wool spots on the flame shaped hemorrhages along with very very typical the nasal angiospasm so if you get these three things you are sure that it is a case of hypertension retinopathy and you can look at the fundus also it's very very neat and clean because all the vessels have gone into thinning and you are left with only cotton wool spots flame shaped hemorrhages and the nasal angiospasm now where do you get these two changes they are present in the nerve fiber layer of the retina they are actually present in the nerve fiber layer of the retina now what is the normal av ratio when i talk about the normal it is 2 is to 3 so where is a wider caliber here we are having spasm spasm or the thinning so now it becomes 1 is to 3 so there is more and more arterial narrowing that you are getting in hypertension retinopathy okay on the other hand if you see this one this is d for diabetic retinopathy or d for dirty fundus also called as D for dirty fundus. So here the cheat code is dirty fundus. Why it is dirty? Because you are having so many hemorrhages. So many hemorrhages may we are going to get very, very small. Very, very small are the micro aneurysms. Then bigger we will get. They are the dots and even bigger we are going to get is the blots. Apart from this, you are getting very small exudates also. These are called as a hard exudates. So when we talk about the earliest stage, what is the earliest stage of the diabetic retinopathy? Another important question, earliest stage is the NPDR and the earliest manifestation of this NPDR is the microaneurysms, that is a hallmark. Then we also get the D for deeper hemorrhages. Deeper hemorrhages can be dots or it can be blots and then we also have the hard exudates we also get the hard exudates now in which layers they are present so it's very very simple if you remember the open i told you that most of the retinal diseases are actually present in these layers so remember hop hop means the hard exudates are present in the outer plexiform layer so now hop has gone so you are left with in so we have got these microaneurysms and deep hemorrhages they are present in the inner nuclear layer so very very conveniently you can remember the changes of hypertension retinopathy are present in the nerve fiber layer hop means hard exudates are present in the outer plexiform layer and the rest of the two are present in the inner nuclear layer okay so uh, see this one uh, in order to show you the marked one i have used this you can see very very small are the micro aneurysms you can see the optic disc so this area is a macula in the macular area you are having so much of exudate so this is a case of the maculopathy this is a case of maculopathy and maculopathy is the most common cause of the diminution of vision in the patients of diabetic retinopathy most common cause of diminution of vision in the patients with diabetic retinopathy is none other than maculopathy now there is a proper misconception uh, usually that uh, the maculopathy will take place only after pdr no maculopathy can take place after npdr also and it can take place after pdr also so this is uh, the npdr this is a npdr which is leading to maculopathy because there is no proliferation no neovascularization here so this is a case of npdr which is leading to the macular involvement okay next this is very very uh, typical called as proliferative diabetic retinopathy that is the pdr now pdr is important this is the most common cause of the this is the most common cause of the recurrent recurrent vitreous hemorrhage in the elderly people and um, this is also the most common cause of the neovascular glaucoma don't confuse it with the 100 day glaucoma 100 day glaucoma is found only in this ARVO but on the whole neovascular glaucoma most commonly is found in the PDR now whenever you have to talk about the PDR what is the hallmark actually the hallmark of PDR is the neovascularization very very important question you can see the optic disc so this will be the NVD NVD means when we are getting at the optic disc and we can get the NVE E like here you are getting this is the elsewhere you can get it over the optic disc this is optic disc you can get it elsewhere also proliferative diabetic retinopathy where the hallmark is the neovascularization 
then we have got this now there is usually a confusion between the hard exudates and the soft exudates that is why i'm trying to show them uh, separately also and there was a question in the neat 2021 that um, they had asked the sign that they are the hard exudates in the diabetic retinopathy they had given an image and they had asked whether it is hard exudates in diabetic retinopathy or it's a hard exudates in hypertension retinopathy or these are the flame shaped hemorrhages and something like this so you have to see these are the small hard exudates when i talk about the hard exudates what are they actually hard exudates are the uh, lipids or they are the lipoproteins these are the hard exudates are the lipids or the lipoproteins while on the other hand if you look at these you can see they are much larger and uh, they are uh, fluffy these are laudaceous so when you see them one by one you can see actually how much different they are so they are resembling the cotton balls that is why they are called as the cotton wool spots that is why they are called as a cotton wool spots and uh, they are occurring due to the retinal hypoxia basically they are occurring due to the retinal hypoxia and because they are due to hypoxia they are the neuronal deposits so they are the neuronal deposits and uh, that is why they are present in the nerve fiber layer so these are usually present in the hypertension retinopathy and hard exudates will be present in the diabetic retinopathy okay now coming to the next one so what are these now see this you have this one this is actually the f f a this is actually the ffa ffa is the investigation of choice in the diabetic retinopathy it is the investigation of choice the diabetic retinopathy now whenever we have a cffa that is fundus flows in angiography what are the things you need to know uh, why this is the investigation of choice in diabetic retinopathy first of all so always remember that diabetic retinopathy is a micro angiopathy it is a micro angiopathy so because it's a angiopathy that is why the investigation of choice is the angiography and uh, the dye that we are instilling this with the help of the anti cubital vein okay so once you have given the dye this will go into the systemic circulation then it will go to the choroidal circulation and finally it will go to the retinal circulation okay now what are the colors that you are going to see whenever we see the ffa there are three colors basically that you see the gray color then uh, the white color and then we have the black color gray is the choroid so the background corio capillaries you can see white is the hemorrhage and black means ischemia okay black is ischemia so here you cannot see any black okay so no ischemia therefore no neovascularization and therefore i can say this is the npdr stage no ischemia no new vascularization so this is npdr now what are the signs of npdr you can see the very very small whitish areas these are very small hemorrhages micro aneurysms you can see bigger than this dots you can see even bigger one these are the blots so i am sure that this is actually the npdr stage of the diabetic retinopathy right on the other hand if you see this one this is very very typical uh, it had come in aims 2019 also here again you can see so many sizes of hemorrhages you have micro aneurysms you have dots and you have got the blots also but one more thing that you are having is very very large pooling of the blood this is the large pooling of the blood the large pooling of the blood is there which is actually called as the neovascularization okay and when we have neovascularization it means that i will have ischemia and ischemia means black color can i see any black color here yes i can see the black color here so this area is near to the optic disc so that means this area is a macula you already know what is the distance between optic disc and macula the two disc diameter so here i can have the two disc yes so that means this is macula and you are having a black area so what is the diagnosis so diagnosis is the ischemic therefore diagnosis is the ischemic maculopathy 
therefore the answer to this question is ischemic maculopathy so the two ffa which are important also we have done coming to the next one the very very typical triad of the retinitis pigmentosa very very typical retinitis pigmentosa so this is usually a boy bilateral night blindness usually a boy will come uh, complaining of the bilateral side night blindness and on examination you are going to get a typical triad so what is a triad that you are going to get one is this one is this one then number two is this one and number three is this one so one is the pale waxy optic disc you are going to get number two we get the pigmentary spicules number two we get the pigmentary spicules or around the retina and number three we get the arteriolar attenuation arteriolar attenuation is also there all the three things are there so even if you have not examined the patient but i give you the clinical scenario that the uh, boy is coming with the bilateral and not only it's bilateral it is also symmetrical bilateral symmetrical night blindness along with this triad you are very very sure that this is actually a case of the retinitis pigmentosa now what are the other questions they can ask they can ask you about the inheritance pattern so inheritance pattern may the most common is the spontaneous always remember that it is actually the spontaneous one uh, rather i would say sporadic it is actually the sporadic which is more common than the familial okay it is more common than the familial and uh, out of the familial if i uh, ask you then it is autosomal recessive followed by autosomal dominant and followed by x linked recessive this is there okay so out of the familial this will be the most common autosomal dominant will give me the best prognosis best prognosis while x-link recessive will give me the worst prognosis so there are number of questions another important thing what are the tests that we can do tests that we can do one is the perimetry that we can do perimetry may we get the typical ring shape scotoma ring shaped scotoma and we can do the eog as well as the erg so which one is the best one this is the investigation of choice another important question it is the electro retinography that is the investigation of choice now what is important in eog in eog we take the ardens ratio or the ardens index another important pyq ardens ratio may we have the maximum peak upon we have the minimum peak we have maximum peak minimum peak multiplied by 100 this is the ardens ratio what are the normal values so more than 185 percent is actually the normal value between uh, 150 to 180 will be the borderline value this is the borderline value then we have less than 150 which is subnormal and uh, less than 125 is actually flat but if i talk about um, the erg if i talk about the erg here we have got the three waves something like this is there so we have got the a wave b wave and the c wave a wave comes from rods and cones b wave shows the activity of the bipolar cells so this is the first order neurons this is the second order neurons and c is the rpe activity so all three are actually affected in cases of retinitis pigmentosa and all three you can see here that is why this is the investigation of choice okay another very very typical picture can you see now sometimes you can confuse it with the headlight in the fog appearance but you can see that was shining light and this is just a yellowish one so this is actually the egg yolk appearance this is the egg yolk appearance and where do you get the egg yolk appearance you get this in the best disease okay so sometimes you know if you are not able to identify which image is this okay please try to see the options uh, earlier also i told you that whenever you get a image based question how you have to go you have to first see the image then you have to read the options okay and only then you have to read the question you have to go in this order only first see the image 
then the options and then you have to read the question so if you have seen the image you are having suppose headlight in the fog appearance and the ague appearance and you read the options so if it is a uh, best disease then they will be talking about the macular disease okay macular dystrophy while if it is headlight in the fog appearance they are talking about the toxoplasmosis ague appearance and what is the um, investigation of choice here it is the eog eog is the best thing that you are having best investigation and also this is the second most common macular dystrophy it is the second most common macular dystrophy then what is the most common when i talk about the most common the most common is this one this is a typical beaten bronze appearance this is the typical beaten bronze appearance the typical beaten bronze appearance is actually seen in the stargardt disease this is seen in the stargardt disease and this is the most common macular dystrophy now investigation of choice uh, in the uh, best disease was the was the eog while here the investigation of choice is actually the ffa okay and on ffa you get a typical sign which is called as the dark or the silent choroid this is another important pyq there was a image based question that where do you get this this you get on the stagger disease on the ffa see this is the picture you can see this blackish area so here we have no gray no gray means no choroidal activity because choroidal activity was appearing as a gray color i told you whitish was the hemorrhage black was the ischemia and gray was the choroid so you are not having any choroidal activity in the macula so this is called as the dark choroid or the silent choroid all right now coming to the next one coming to the next one i think everybody knows this the beautiful mushroom pattern this is the beautiful mushroom pattern which is also called as the umbrella pattern or it is also called as the smoke stack pattern so these patterns are again seen on the ffa in cases of the csr so if i am talking about the csr what is the typical profile i am going to get 20 to 50 years male i am going to get type a personality it can be i can get the history of 3s we will have stress we will have a uh, smoking and we will also have the steroids stress smoking and steroids coming with the distorted vision or the metamorphopsia distorted vision or the metamorphopsia and if you are getting this mushroom pattern then you are very very sure about this csr the another pattern that i can get here is this one i can also get the ink blot pattern or it is also called as the enlarging dot sign this is also called as the enlarging dot sign these are the two ffa pictures that i can get now once i am sure that this is the csr what is the treatment csr treatment is again important you have to just wait and watch we have to wait and watch for the spontaneous resolution we have to wait and watch for the spontaneous resolution why because usually it will take place in 4 to 12 weeks so just wait and watch and the patient will get fine okay now on the other hand um, like in csr we were getting the typical uh, mushroom pattern or the ink blot pattern we get here the typical flower petal appearance so this flower petal appearance on the ffa is very very typically found in the cystoid macular edema why because we are having the fluid in the two layers that is outer plexiform layer or the inner nuclear layer always think about again open okay and this outer plexiform layer is also called as the henle's layer another pyq it is also called as the henle's layer and this contains the petaloid fibers it contains the petaloid fibers and that is why we get the flower petal appearance so very very uh, typically found and because we are having the multiple cyst like areas therefore over the fundus also we get the typical honey comb appearance in the fundus we get the typical honey comb appearance when we get the flower petal appearance on ffa now what is very very important here is the etiology of cme 
very very important one is the retinitis pigmentosa number two it can be associated with the uveitis and number three is the niacin toxicity so this question came in 2020 need that which vitamin in the supraphysiological doses can cause a cystoid macular edema Number four is the prostaglandin analogs. Prostaglandin analogs are there. Then I told you non ischemic kind of CRVO that is there. Then uh, we have the Irwin gas syndrome. Another important thing is the Irwin gas syndrome. And I hope you remember what was it. This is after the cataract surgery. If it is occurring after the cataract surgery, it is called as the Irwin gas syndrome. Then we can have in the diabetic retinopathy. And finally, we can also have the epinephrine. Epinephrine can also cause cystoid macular edema in cases of the AFAQ. Yeah, all these are very, very important causes of cystoid macular edema once you are sure you can treat treatment will be steroids okay there we were doing wait and watch here we have to give the steroids so all of the clinical profile you know now something uh, related with the ophtha and petho something related with the ophtha and petho you can see that these are the rosettes and uh, rosettes where you can see the empty lumen this is the empty lumen so which rosettes are there where you can see the empty lumen Therefore, these rosettes are the flexner. These are the flexner winter steener. Flexner winter steener rosettes because you can see the empty lumen. On the other hand, if you see these rosettes, okay, these are also the rosettes, but you cannot see the empty lumen here. You cannot see. So it is lumen. The lumen is not seen. Because it is not seen, therefore it is the Homer right rosettes. Very, very important. Okay, and this is the identifying picture. Once you know about these rosettes, you should know that both of them are present in the retinoblastoma. And retinoblastoma is coming from the gene 13Q14 and two gene mutations are required. Two gene mutations are required. This is called as the Nutson. Two hit hypothesis Nutson to hit hypothesis is there you should know the clinical pro uh, presentation first most common sign second most common sign and the third most common sign so first will be the leukocoria second is the squint and third is the glaucoma always remember these are the most important clinical features then the root of spread is again a very very important pyq you know you should know that the most common root of spread is actually the direct root and in the direct root it is optic nerve now there was a question in the inset also where they gave the both then what to do ma'am then you have to choose the optic nerve microscopic examination we have already shown you flexner winter steener rosette and the homerite rosette investigation of choice will be the mri orbit always remember uh, we are avoiding the ct scan because there is a risk of radiation exposure so i do not want to give the risk of radiations to a, such a small child because uh, usually the child diagnosis will be done in less than three years so a very very small child usually one and a half years you do not want to give the radiation exposure now in order to complete the topic let us um, see the treatment part also treatment may there are three categories one is unilateral small one is a unilateral large and then we have bilateral unilateral small may i can do the tumor destruction by cryo or we can do laser if it is large then i can do the e nucleation and if it is bilateral then i have to do the chemo in the chemo we give the vec regimen this is again important 2019 need pg examination uh, we have the vincristine. This is the vincristine. Then we have E, E for etoposide. And uh, then we have C, C for carboplatin. That is also there. Vincristine, etoposide and carboplatin. All right. Now coming to this next one. Now this is the beautiful, you can see, pie in the sky appearance. The beautiful pie in the sky appearance, which is also called as a superior quadrant 
anopia superior quadrant anopia quadrant means this one so this, if it would have been total then this would have been hemianopia now we have divided this so this is the superior quadrants while these are the inferior quadrants so this is the superior quadrant anopia blindness in the superior so which fibers will be affected opposite fibers therefore i can say inferior fibers are affected inferior fibers are affected so if inferior fibers are affected where they are present in the temporal lobe therefore it's a lesion of temporal lobe and temporal lobe means optic radiation so you have to always remember you have to always remember that in temporal lobe we have got the in we got the superior quadrant anopia so you can remember it by the mnemonic st st elevation you can remember it with the st elevation as for superior quadrant anopia and t for temporal lobe okay on the other hand if you get the opposite of this so if you get opposite of this you can see the inferior sides are affected this is called as the pi in the flow here you are going to get pi in the floor or this is also called as the inferior quadrant anopia this is called as the inferior quadrant anopia so inferior quadrants on both the sides are affected so if inferior quadrant is affected that means superior fibers are affected and superior fibers are actually present in the parietal lobe and parietal lobe is leading to inferior quadrant anopia can be remembered as pi peripheral aridectomy is a mnemonic here p for parietal lobe i for inferior quadrant anopia you can remember by the st elevation and the inferior quadrant anopia okay now coming to the next one so these are the visual pathway defects now though um, you have read visual pathway defects so many times but still we can uh, get a get a quick recap of all these defects so when we have defect in the optic nerve whenever we are having the defect in the optic nerve you can see we are having the total blindness on the side of lesion and there is normal so there is total blindness here while we are having the normal vision here then by temporal you can see um, if i say this is temporal just a second this is temporal temporal this is nasal and nasal so this is actually by temporal so this is by temporal hemianopia by temporal hemianopia so if the temporal blindness is there therefore which fibers will be affected it is the nasal fibers therefore nasal fibers are affected if the nasal fibers are affected therefore it is a lesion of optic chiasma therefore it is a lesion of optic chiasma next you can see <clears throat> next you can see that same sides of both the eyes this is the right eye field and this is the left eye field so right side left side right side and left side so you can see that it is the left side of both the eyes which are getting affected so it is actually contralateral homonemous contralateral homonemous hemianopia contralateral homonemous hemianopia that you are going to get and where you are getting this for the first time in the lesions of the optic tract in the lesions of the optic tract we are going to get this for the first time and it is also the most common defect then after this level be it the lateral genuclear body or be it the optic radiations or be it the visual cortex you are going to get the same but i told you just now that we can divide the lesions of the optic radiations we can divide the lesions of the optic radiations into the two lobes one is the pi in the sky and we can divide this into the pi in the floor so we have already talked about pi in the sky is st so this will be in the temporal lobe lesion and pi in the floor that is pi so this will be found in the parietal lobe this is found in the parietal lobe lesion and then this is something here central area is spared so this is your contralateral homonemous contralateral homonemous hemianopia contralateral homonemous hemianopia along with the macular sparing very very important now why we are having this macular sparing macular sparing is actually due to the double blood supply 
due to the double blood supply because the macula is having the double blood supply what is a double blood supply the posterior cerebral artery along with the middle cerebral artery so while the posterior cerebral artery continues to supply the only the periphery the middle cerebral artery will give both uh, along with the posterior cerebral artery both will give to the macula so if this vision has gone also middle cerebral artery will continue to supply the, the macula and therefore we will continue to have vision and therefore we will have the central sparing so this area will continue to have vision this is called as macular sparing very very important okay Now another important picture, this actually came in the NEAT 2022, you can see these blackish areas, this is the scleromalacia perforans, scleromalacia perforans is there and sometimes it mimics with the ciliary, it mimics with the ciliary stephyloma with the ciliary stephyloma but actually this is not ciliary stephyloma okay because uh, usually they will give you a history that this is found in the elderly female along with the rheumatoid arthritis plus you can see more than one area you can see this blackish areas also so if you are able to see the black areas more than one area is there because ciliary stephyloma will only be in the ciliary region and plus you are having this elderly female with the rheumatoid arthritis then you know that it is a case of scleromalacia perforans so this is a kind of scleritis if you look at um, the classification when i talk about the scleritis it can be anterior scleritis or the posterior scleritis anterior is present in 98 percent posterior only in 2 percent and posterior scleritis gives a typical t sign on the b scan ultra sound we are going to get now this anterior scleritis can be of two types it can be non-necrotizing or it can be the necrotizing Non-necrotizing can be nodular or it can be diffuse. Okay, so it is this diffuse one which is most common. So I can say that it is diffuse, non-necrotizing and scleritis, which is most common. While if I talk about this necrotizing, this can be with inflammation or it can be without inflammation it can be without inflammation also so if it is without inflammation and uh, it is present in the elderly female with the rheumatoid arthritis then it is called as the scleromalacia scleromalacia perforans then this is called as scleromalacia perforans the typical aspect which was given in the question okay now let us see the ciliary stephyloma also this is actually the ciliary stephyloma so there should not be any confusion between the uh, what you call as the scleromalacia perforans and the ciliary stephyloma first of all what is the meaning of stephyloma stephyloma means the bunch of grapes like appearance because it is formed from the word stephylose it is formed from the word cephylose and when it is occurring in the ciliary region if it is occurring in the ciliary region then it is called as ciliary stephyloma and uh, if you are getting a ciliary stephyloma that means they will give you something related with the ciliary region it can be any disease of ciliary body it can be trauma of the ciliary body something like this okay plus it will be not associated with the thinning of the sclera it is present only in one area there will be no history of elderly female with rheumatoid arthritis so all these things will help you in differentiating whether it's a stephyloma or whether it's a scleromalacia perforans another very very important picture neat pg 2019 may same picture had come and recently in the fmg examination also 2023 and 2022 maybe we got this picture so you can see this is the typical tear drop sign tear drop sign you get in cases of the blow out fracture blow out fracture and uh, this is common in the inferior wall also remember that the investigation of choice is the x-ray orbit the investigation of choice is the x-ray orbit where you are going to get this typical tear drop sign 
Coming to the next one, another important question of the NEET 2022. We had got the same image, image based question. This is actually called as the voscious ring. This is called as a voscious ring. Voscious ring is found in the blunt trauma. So again, all the things which are related to the blunt trauma are very, very important. We have discussed with the Berlin Zedema and the cherry red spot also. This voscious ring is the imprint. It is the imprint of the pupillary border. Pupillary border of the iris on the anterior anterior surface of the lens so whenever we are getting this imprint you can see this brownish imprint of the iris on the anterior surface of the lens that is called as the osseous ring okay now coming to the next one uh, another very very important thing is actually the corneal ulcer so whenever you are getting a question on the corneal ulcers we should be knowing how to differentiate between the four kind of infective ulcers so if you see this is the bacterial keratitis or the bacterial corneal ulcer whenever we are having the bacterial keratitis what are the properties you will have a single ulcer you are not going to have the multiple lesions you can see the vascularization typically vascularization is present you can see the acute red eye and that is why the signs and symptoms will be similar to the acute anterior uveitis you will get a hypopion. We have discussed about um, hypopion pus in the anterior chamber. And whenever we have hypopion in the bacterial keratitis, it is always sterile and always mobile. So very, very important are these features for the bacterial keratitis. And because we are having the vascularization, the chances of perforation are very, very high. The chances of perforation are also very, very high. While exactly the opposite will have happen in cases of the fungal corneal ulcer if i talk about the fungal corneal ulcer so we have got the b that is called as the fungal keratitis if i talk about the fungal keratitis here the signs will be more than the symptoms you are going to get typically signs more than symptoms you are having no vascularization here and you are having the uh, finger like projections you are having the finger like projections because we have hyphae here and because we have so many finger like projections they will be causing the multiple multiple satellite lesions we are going to get the multiple satellite lesions also so we are having the signs more than symptoms we are not having any vascularization therefore the perforation is also rare finger like projections multiple satellite lesions then we are going to have the history of vegetative trauma this is again very very important usually the fishtail injury or a root injury stem injury then the hypopions. Hypopion will be present but it will be non-sterile and non-mobile. It will be non-sterile and non-mobile. So whenever you are getting these things, think about the fungal ulcer along with the immune ring. Wesley's ring of demarcation. We have the Wesley's ring of demarcation that is also present on the fungal ulcer. Coming to the next one, this is very, very typical. Number C, it is the viral keratitis. You can see the typical dendritic keratitis. This is very, very typical dendritic keratitis. You can see the tree-like arborizing pattern. Very, very typical tree-like arborizing pattern is there. And uh, whenever we have got the true dendritic ulcer, true dendrite means we have these knobs also present and we have the floor also. Knobs and floor are present. It's a true dendritic keratitis present in the herpes simplex. Then it is a case of herpes simplex. Okay, very, very typical. Now, whenever we have this, what you will give in the treatment? We will give the 3% acyclovir. We are going to give 3% acyclovir, but the steroids steroids are contraindicated this is again a very important pyq always remember steroids are contraindicated and um, if you give the steroids then this can lead to larger ulcer that is called as the geographical ulcer 
or it is also called as the amoeboid ulcer then in that case it is called as the geographical ulcer or the amoeboid ulcer next is number d this is the acanthamoeba keratitis this is the acanthamoeba keratitis and for this you have to remember a r c okay abnormal retinal correspondence a r c is the mnemonic a for acanthamoeba r for the ring abscess or the ring infiltrate the typical ring infiltrate you are going to get here and we also get the radial keratoneuritis radial keratoneuritis we get the ring infiltrate radial keratoneuritis and see for the contact lenses so if you are getting the ulcer related with the contact lenses along with the radial keratoneuritis along with the ring infiltrate along with the canthamoeba then you are you have to give the treatment according to that so what is the treatment here treatment will be the polyhexa methylene biguanide with or without the propamidine with or without the propamidine okay <clears throat> now coming to this one this is again very very important you can see this is called as the pterygium this is the pterygium pterygium means we will have the wing shaped fold so we are having the wing shaped fold of the pterygium uh, of the conjunctiva coming over the cornea it has three parts this is the head portion this is the body this is the uh, body portion and this is the tail portion and uh, it can be of two types basically pterygiums can be of two types it can be aggressive or it can be regressive type it can be aggressive or regressive aggressive means if the hyperplasia okay hyperplasia is more than the degeneration while if the degeneration is more than the hyperplastic changes then this is called as the regressive type so obviously if you are having lot of vascularization then it will be aggressive type of the thing now whenever we have this okay you have to remember that what are the clinical features we can have number one very very important is that you can have the astigmatism because it is pressing the cornea it can have the astigmatism this is most common and the type of astigmatism is with the rule astigmatism then if it is growing and it is covering the pupil it can also cause the obstruction of the pupillary axis then in that case it can also cause the obstruction of pupillary axis this question is ne 2019 most common cause of diminution of vision now there are also many students mark obstruction of pupillary axis which is actually wrong every derigium will cause astigmatism but every derigium will not obstruction uh, will not cause obstruction of pupillary axis so most common is always astigmatism okay now what is the treatment so once you are sure that this is there you have to do the surgical excision and um, there was a question in the inset examination also november 2022 that um, when we do the surgical excision will we get recurrence or not so obviously we get the recurrence 30 to 70% chances that there is actually recurrence and we have to use certain drugs like um, metomycin c we can use the thiotepa we can uh, emit the beta radiations we can emit the beta radiations we can also give the amniotic membrane grafting amniotic membrane grafting we can do these are the things that we can do for the pterygium then coming to the next again a important thing you can see these these are actually the white foamy spots these are the white foamy spots which are present over the temporal uh, side of the conjunctiva these are found in cases of the vitamin a deficiency what are these called as these are called as the white dot spots very very important and there was again as such question the same image came as a image based question and they asked that which vitamin deficiency will show this so actually it is a vitamin a deficiency that is going to show okay and then the important thing is the order so this will uh, child will come usually with the night blindness that will be the earliest symptom this is going to be the earliest symptom right 
then we are going to have the sign so in the signs what will be the first sign first is the conjunctival xerosis then next will be the bitot spots bitot spots and then will be the corneal xerosis it is this order after the corneal xerosis we will have the keratomalacia that is corneal ulcers will be there and finally we will have the zero of thalmia we will have the zero of thalmia or the drying that will be there that is the zero of thalmic fundus coming to the next now again a very important thing is how will you differentiate between the giant papillary conjunctivitis and the cobblestone appearance now look here you can see so many papilla but there is one papilla which is much larger than the other ones so this is actually a case of a giant papillary conjunctivitis giant papillary conjunctivitis when one papillae is more than the others papillae size and usually it is more than 0.3 you can see then you should also know what is the meaning of papilla and what is the meaning of follicles if i talk about the papillae papillae are actually the blood vessels these are actually the blood vessels and um, usually one of the papillae get giant it can be due to any sutures or it can be any prosthesis that can be there okay or it can be any allergy that can also be there so but it has to be a localized then so any um, nylon suture can be there or it can be even the soft contact lenses so it shows that uh, soft contact lenses causes more of the giant papillary conjunctivitis than the hard contact lenses or it can be a localized allergic response a localized irritation from the prosthesis or it can be nylon sutures on the other hand if you are getting the diffuse polygonal raised areas if you are getting these polygonal raised areas in the palpebral conjunctiva if i am getting these polygonal raised areas in the palpebral conjunctiva then this is actually called as the cobblestone appearance then this is called as the cobblestone appearance and this cobblestone appearance is present in the vernal keratoconjunctivitis very very typical so vernal keratoconjunctivitis which is also called as the spring catarrh it is also called as the spring catarrh and uh, this is actually a misnomer because actually it is not common in spring season this is common in the hot and humid climate so in hot and humid climate if you are having a young male along with the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction along with the itching and with a very very typical type of discharge which is called as ropey discharge or it is called as the stingy discharge we are having very typical discharge ropey discharge or stingy discharge along with the cobblestone appearance along with the horner trenta spots very very typical horner trenta spots which are actually the collections of the eosinophil cells because it's a allergy along with the shield ulcers the typical ulcers that you get in cornea shield ulcers in on the cornea then it is vernal keratoconjunctivitis and treatment of choice will be the olopatidine always remember the treatment of choice is not steroids it is the olopatidine while on the other hand if you get a very localized allergy this is the nodular keratoconjunctivitis this is a nodular keratoconjunctivitis which is called as the filictinula filictinula keratoconjunctivitis this is common in the females and um, this is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction and also it is a endogenous sensitivity reaction okay so here basically it can be due to the staph proteins and followed by the tubercular proteins staph proteins followed by the tubercular proteins so you have to be very very sure see if i have to differentiate between vkc and the pkc one is common in male one is common in female one is the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction this is type 4 
here you get the diffuse kind of allergy while here you are going to get the nodular kind of allergy this was the exogenous kind of allergy while this is the endogenous kind of allergy right so the treatment here will be the olopatidine the treatment will be olopatidine while here the treatment will be the steroids this is how you have to differentiate it and of course you have got the image also all right now coming to the next one again important for your 2023 this is again important for 2023 you can see the conical protrusion of the cornea so this is actually the keratoconus now uh, there are two things here we are having the conical protrusion instead of this normal cornea we are having this conical protrusion of the cornea so we are having the increased axial length due to this increased axial length this person is going to be myopic okay then second important thing is that we are also having the irregular surface we are also having the irregular surface due to this irregular surface we are also having the astigmatism so basically there are two things this person will be having myopia as well as the astigmatism so main problem is the surface so i have to do the flattening of the cornea we have to do the flattening of the cornea so what i can do either uh, i can uh, flatten it by the intex i will talk about this or number 2 i can change the surface of cornea i can give the um, semi soft semi soft or the rigid contact lenses i can give contact lenses then number 3 i can also do the keratoplasty where i can change the cornea itself uh, on the um, progression side if i want to reduce the progression so we can reduce the progression of this keratoconus by giving the topical riboflavin riboflavin drops we can give the topical riboflavin drops and we can do the rest of the progression that is again very very important then there are certain signs like uh, we have the walk stria walk stria are important like in walk stria these are the vertical striations these are vertical they are present in keratoconus while if you remember the half stria h4 half and h4 horizontal this was found in the buccal moss this was found in the buccal moss and vertical is present in keratoconus another important thing is the flesher's ring here flesher's ring is present here which is due to the iron deposition while if you remember the stalker's line stalker's line is important stalker's line is found in the pterygium due to the iron deposition then we had talked about the kf ring also that was due to the copper deposition so these two things are again very very important then another important sign that you get here is the munson sign another important sign is the munson sign now what is the meaning of the munson sign if you look at the picture here uh, there is localized bulging of this lower eyelid so this is actually the localized bulging whenever we are having the localized bulging of the lower eyelid when the patient looks in the downward gaze that is in the inferior gaze then that is called as the munson sign all these things are again important with respect to the keratoconus all right now see this one this is also a picture that uh, came in neat 2022 and they said that is it is used in it is actually used in the keratoconus this is actually used in the keratoconus so what is this so see this this is actually the infrastromal corneal ring that we are using in keratoconus and how it is actually acting it is causing the flattening of the cornea so in order to decrease the power we are using it when i decrease the power we are decreasing the myopia and what was the main refractive status in keratoconus it was myopia and astigmatism so that is the mechanism of action of the intex and you can see the picture also another important uh, question that can come as a image based question you can see this band which is formed over the cornea so this is a band shape keratopathy band shape keratopathy okay this is a band shape keratopathy and uh, b for baumann's membrane so here we have the accumulation which is present in the baumann's membrane and b ke baad we have c so we have the calcium 
deposition so basically we are getting the calcium deposition in the bowman's membrane and uh, uh, after the uh, after this we have got the e e is for the edta the treatment treatment ke liye we are using the edta because edta is a chelating agent it is a chelating agent that is there so we have b b for bowman's membrane then we have got c c for calcium then we have got c for chelating agent and then we have e that is e d t a so you can remember b e c we have got the b for bowman's membrane c for calcium c for and then e for edta now the causes also we have number of causes here uh, we have the stills disease we have got the sarcoidosis we have got the sarcoidosis or, or wherever we are actually having the hypercalcemia like we can have the vitamin d toxicity also now what are the conditions where we can have hypercalcemia uh, we can have the chronic keratitis chronic keratitis or we can have the chronic uveitis we can have uh, even the mercury exposure if the patient is having lot of mercury exposure then also we can have this band shaped keratopathy all right now see this yes this was a picture i was looking in the beginning here you can see the two uh, types of conjunctiva this is the palpebral conjunctiva and this is the bulbar conjunctiva this is the bulbar so basically this is the symblephron this is the adhesion of the palpebral conjunctiva with the bulbar conjunctiva which should be differentiated from the ankyloblephron now coming to the eyelids now what you can see here this is a pus and pus is pointing towards the lid margin here the pus is pointing towards the lid margin therefore this is called as a sty okay this is called as a sty and uh, the sty is also called as the external hordulum it is also called as external hordulum it is occurring in the gland of mol or the gland of zeis and uh, what will be the treatment whenever you are shown something like this there are three treatments first of all we start with the warm compresses this is the first thing that we are going to start so whenever they are asking you the first step is this then you can give the anesthetics and finally we have to give the antibiotics this is a sequence of events that you have to do while on the other hand if this pus is pointing away this is the pus which is away from the lid margin from the lid margin if this pus is away from the lid margin then this is called as the internal hordulum treatment is same as that of the sty the treatment will remain same as that of the sty or the external hordulum while the third important condition the third very very important is this one this is actually called as a calesion calesion is actually nodular this is a nodular and also this is painless it is a lipogranulomatous inflammation it is a lipogranulomatous inflammation and basically it is occurring in the meibomian gland and you know that meibomian gland is a sebaceous gland so the, because this is a sebaceous gland that is why if we are having the recurrent calesion always remember if i am having the recurrent calesion then there is a risk of sebaceous cell carcinoma sebaceous cell carcinoma while most common lid carcinoma as a whole is the basal cell carcinoma so two very very important questions when i talk about hordulums they are painful they are acute separative inflammation treatment is antibiotics and warm compresses with the ansets while if i am talking about the calesion it will be painless it will be nodular lipogranulomatous meibomian gland and we will have the risk of sebaceous gland carcinoma now see this this is very very important you can see this is actually the coca cola coca cola bottle sign this is the typical coca cola bottle sign that we get in the thyroid eye disease which is the typical integration of the ophtha plus the radio here we are having the involvement of the extraocular muscles where whole belly is involved 
whole belly is involved but very very typical we are sparing the tendons whole belly is involved sparing the tendons so tendon is not involved tendon is not involved that means the origin and the insertion will not be involved that is called as the coca cola bottle sign so always remember that the most common cause of the proptosis whenever we are talking about the proptosis in the adults the most common sign uh, cause of the proptosis in adults is actually the thyroid eye disease okay a typical scenario may we have female we have the middle age okay middle age along with the smoking and uh, if you look at the thyroid status 90% will have the hyperthyroidism 6% will have euthyroidism and 4% can have the hypothyroidism also hypo but this does not mean that if you are having euthyroidism or hypothyroidism you cannot have the thyroid eye disease like this question came in NEET 2020 that female was coming with the proptosis with the youth thyroid status then also answer was thyroid eye disease only okay now see very very typical um, now whenever you get such kind of a question the trick is that always start from the primary position central image so you can typically see the ptosis here ptosis means the lps palsy and lps is supplied by the third nerve so you already know that this is actually a case of third nerve palsy then you can look at the eye the eye is also you can see this is also the down and out it is also down and out okay so if you are able to see these two things you are able to see the ptosis you are able to see down and out then these are sufficient enough to say it's a third nerve palsy now when i talk about the third nerve palsy okay what happens all the muscles are paralyzed because all are supplied by third nerve except for so4 and the lr6 now what are the functions of so4 so4 primary function secondary function and tertiary function because it's a oblique muscle so primary will be torsion and superiors are in totters so primary action will be in torsion then coming to the secondary secondary may offer oblique and offer opposite so this will cause the depression therefore it will cause depression and then we have a tertiary may always remember the red recti are adductors so oblique will cause abduction then we have lateral rectus lateral rectus also causes abduction so maximum spared is the abduction another important thing is which action of the extraocular muscle is spared maximally that will be abduction and also we are going to get the pupil dilated why we are getting the pupil dilated because it's the efferent nerve third nerve is the efferent nerve so you also get the pupil dilated okay now a very very important thing this is a mlf lesion this is a mlf lesion which is also called as the internuclear ophthalmoplegia so uh, whenever we have a mlf lesion the first you can see this is the baseline okay now this is the right eye so when the person is looking in the right gaze and in this the person is looking in the left gaze okay so when the person is looking in the right gaze we have normal adduction and we have the normal abduction so this is okay but when the person is looking in the left gaze we are having the abduction abduction along with the nystagmus and we are having no adduction so we are having what what we are having here we are having the right adduction deficit and we are having left abduction nystagmus so what is the conclusion here i am having left time in stagmus and abduction right eye adduction deficit therefore this will be the right mlf lesion therefore it's a right mlf lesion means whenever we are having the mlf lesion okay you have to always remember two things we will have ipsilateral adduction deficit and we will have contralateral abduction nystagmus contralateral abduction nystagmus so because here we were having the right adduction deficit therefore right mlf lesion now another thing is we can also call it as right ino i can also call it as right ino but if i have to say in terms of gaze so this person will not be able to see in the left gaze so or i can say it is a left gaze palsy so this is also called as a left gaze palsy so 
so with this we have come up to the end of this image based session and uh, i would say rather it's a image based session along with the pyq session along with the mini revision of ophthalmology i hope uh, you have enjoyed the session and you will be benefited by this so whenever you have some problem in revision of ophthalmology and you are not able to go through whole of the notes i think this is the best way of going through the ophthalmology and this pdf you are going to get in the telegram group of a uh, Uh, the file section okay so check in the file section of my telegram group and you are going to get this so see this video as soon as possible download the pdf of my telegram group and go about the ophthalmology i am sure you will love it and you will come in flying colors all the best happy ophthalmology